This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and join their calls for justice. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Fuck off. (laughs) (laughs) A knock at the front door typically inspires one of two questions. Who the hell is that? Or do I have to put pants on for this? (laughs) No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. What's wrong with your life? <laughs> yes, it does. What's going it on? It does. According, according to Courtney Crook, or Crook, a uh, journalist at the Nine Fairfax Papers who published this article this week with the headline, Has a politician knocked on your door of late? If so, did they sway your views? Mm-hmm. That's right. It's a door knocking article. The feature image is, of course, when you look on the website, it is that classic Max Chandler May that with his hand, his fist raised about to knock on a door and his like Bunnings hat clipboard in arm. Um, what do you think of this article? I think it's the dumbest thing I've ever read. Slash, wow. Well, I've read it. No, that's I've read there a lot of dumb things. There are a few contenders for that. I don't know about yes, that. Yes, that's true. I think it is I a truly bizarre piece. <laughs> yes. I don't quite understand the point of this article. I feel like it's just that I think this was maybe just published in the Brisbane Times. And so, yeah, given there's a Queensland state election, probably a lot of people in Brisbane are getting door knocked. And so maybe they're like, well, we should just publish an article about it because people might click on it because they relate. Um, without us having any news, analysis, opinion, any of that whatsoever. Um, This is the article. So it starts with that two questions um, assertion. And she says, last week I gambled on the ladder, that is the two I have to put pants on for this um, question. I don't really know. Anyway, I gambled on the ladder and wearing a long T-shirt, answered the door to a Greens volunteer named Ashley. It was my second political door knocker in as many weeks. Now, no offence to Ashley, but I don't particularly like door knockers. And since my days of peddling chocolates in primary school, I don't like door knocking either. I'm in the comfort and privacy of my home. You are in yours. Let's leave it that way. Yeah, let's fuck society. Let's everybody stay in your own houses. Everyone's alienated and depressed and <laughs> yeah. lost faith in connecting with their neighbours and let's keep it that way. That's good. I don't want to interact with yeah, anyone. This is the first when someone who knocks like- on my door, my question is, who the hell is that? I hope it's not another human being that I have to yes. talk to and engage with. Jesus Christ. That's a, the normal response. Okay. I mean, okay, I will say it's funny because talking about this, I was talking about this at work recently and I thought if I, even if I had the same political views as I do, but I was not as like horrifically engaged as I am, I think if someone knocked on my door, I would be like, go away. I do not want to speak to you. I am in I'm money, my own business. Like it's the weekend. I'm relaxing. No, thank you. So I I get it. Like I think she's maybe kind of not – she's not wrong. If you've door knocked, like it's true. People don't necessarily want – a lot of people don't want to have a conversation with a stranger. That's fair. But I don't – when she's like, I'm in the comfort and privacy of my home, you are in yours, let's leave it that way. Like, no, that doesn't mean that it's it's right or good. Um, She says – I doubt I'm in the minority, but I can't help but wonder how effective door knocking is and whether it has a place in future political campaigns. First time having thoughts. Um, (laughs) (laughs) University of Queensland lecturer in political science, Adam Hanna, says it's difficult for political scientists to evaluate the efficacy of political door knocking or canvassing because of the lack of large scale research into the practice in Australia. Uh, He said parties do their own research and they suggest that a really well organized field campaign, which is a bit broader than just door knocking, might make a one to two percentage point difference in a given electorate. Um. I mean, who said that? Like, what parties? Uh, presumably this is the major parties who do not door knock effectively, whereas, like, right. the Greens obviously would say it's more than a 1% to 2% point difference. It's the entire, like, it can be a 10% point difference. But the, but this is, you know, the major parties in the mainstream media refuse to accept this, which is why whenever they're like, how did you win this? And we're, like, door knocking, and they're like, it must be the demographics. <laughs> <laughs> it's because there were no teal candidates running mm, in those no uh, particular seats. I mean, it's just there is no acknowledgement of the incredible political success that the Greens have achieved in the area that she's talking about. She's the city reporter of Brisbane, by the way, this this lady for the Brisbane Times. Mm-hmm. And yes, like you want an example? Well, political scientists can't figure out this Excel chart as to whether this makes a two percent. Look at the fucking results. This is what they did, and these are all the seats that they won, and they did really well. So there's probably something going on there and worth investigating, for God's sake. 
Yeah, I mean, she goes on to argue that basically door knocking is more is it makes sense in the US where they don't have compulsory voting because it's helpful to get out the vote, but there's apparently little evidence that you can change someone's mind on the door, which is not the like that does not hold in terms of the evidence that that we have. Roughly one in three conversations from our reckoning can change a vote if you're actually door knocking to have meaningful conversations and persuasive conversations, not just voter ID, which is what the major parties are often doing, where they just are like gathering data, which is why like there's a poll embedded in this article that I see not many people have um, engaged with. So clearly this didn't get as many <laughs> as many um, maybe, clicks maybe as they were hoping. Maybe a times she'd go out and do some door knocking if they want to find yes, out what people actually think about this stuff. Rather more than, than 100, 180 votes, so get 180 <laughs> meaningfuls easily. Because um, yeah. they ask, do you think door knocking is an effective campaign tool? The options are no, yes, and depends who's knocking. As of my, I just um, revealed it by voting. There's 180 votes, 38% say no, 31% say yes, and 31%, 31% say depends who's knocking. Right. I feel like these, wonderful... media, these article polls are always incredibly scientific and, and real. Use my time. She talks about the Greens, debates over the extent to which it had an effect in 2022, blah, blah, blah. What does she say? Political door knocking has something in common with door-to-door sales, a practice that had a straightforward purpose pre-digital age. Will canvassing eventually die out with modernization? <laughs> and modernize this it's okay. I I want to say mean things about how much this reads like a university assignment, but like, I don't know, maybe she just <laughs> smashed it out at the request of her editor. Who knows? Well, will canvassing eventually die out with modernization and the continued encroachment of technology in all facets of our of our lives? It's like, well. No, again, not acknowledging the fact that talking to someone face to face Mm. is what people fucking crave. Like as if people want more more digital ads to sell either products or political parties to them rather than a human being standing on their doorstep, sincerely asking them what they think about the world, what they don't like about their lives, what they want to see change in politics. I mean, that is the that is the crucial crucial secret source difference that door knocking is all about. People love going back to IRL. That's what's making a massive difference, clearly. Mm. Well, yes, her conclusion to her article is a very assertive and clear, different things work for different people. For me, that means I might have to continue hiding behind the curtain, waiting for the Jehovah's Witnesses to leave. But for others, maybe this is just the thing they need to cast an informed vote next month. Brilliant. <laughs> we've, really, we've, really we've incisive so stuff. Finish, finish piece, send invoice, go back to bed. <laughs> but I'll tell you what she doesn't mention at any point in this article. What happened when she talked what to Ashley? did Ashley I know. I'm like, who was Ashley? Who were they door knocking for? What did they ask? What did you say? How did you feel yes. after the conversation? Like anything? No? Okay. Just quickly on this while we're talking about door knocking as a little tidbit, there's this, there's a piece going around on, on Reddit at the moment. And actually I've heard from people who have also heard from multiple people in the Miller electorate where former transport minister Mark Bailey is under threat from the Greens candidate Liam Flannerty that he, like, people are finding, sorry, I missed you pamphlets um, in their letterbox. And they're like, but I was, I've been home the entire time. Or or I checked the seat, I checked my little ring camera thing and no one came to my door. And so I love that, like, (laughs) he's like too scared, doesn't want to actually talk to people, but is aware that maybe thinks that just the illusion of door knocking is how the Greens win campaigns. And so he's like, I also, I too am door knocking. So sorry, I couldn't stop to chat. Yeah, right. They're they're just hiring the same people who get hired to put like um, Kmart magazines or catalogs into yeah. people's uh, letterboxes and sending them out there, for God's sake. Yeah. Well, apparently he himself is actually out late at night letterboxing, which, you know, I guess um, good on him. <laughs> okay. That respect. But I mean, the, the quote from political scientists saying that like this message is only receptive if people, is only effective if people are already receptive to the message you're saying. It's like, well, yeah, of course. I mean, although, as you say, we've had lots of experiences of door knocking where you've got someone who said, I've always voted One Nation, listen to Green's policies, and then yeah. at least indicate that they're open to changing. But I mean, yes, I mean, people who are receptive to the message of progressive politics who have voted Labour all their life mm. may very well be amenable to the idea of saying, how's that going for you? Do you think they're yes. delivering on what they're saying? And here's what the Greens are about. How about considering switching your vote this election? I mean, that's, yes. that's clearly having a big impact on these seats. And so- 
And 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 again, I mean, what is the point of this this piece? Is it to try to demoralize people and I sort of say, "Stop no, knocking on I my door"? I don't think there's any point to it. I don't think there's a point to it. I think she's <laughs> just like something happened to me. It is tangentially related to the election that's upcoming. And instead of writing about that experience, I'll just <laughs> I don't know throw some experts' lines in there and little quips about long long sleeve t shirts and Jehovah's Witnesses. So. I guarantee you. Either in the past or in the future, the same person will write a piece about how, oh, we don't talk to each other anymore and we're also isolated and alienated. <laughs> <laughs> Technology is ruining our lives. Yeah. And then, who the fuck is that? I'm getting my <laughs> shotgun. Piss off. It's the Green Party. They're all losers. It's a waste of fucking money is what it is. It's, yeah, and we don't rock with We don't rock with the Greens of any country, of any yeah. nation. We don't rock with them at Speaking all. Speaking of the Greens. We're stuck with the hosts of Chapo Shithouse podcast. Serious danger to Australia. Well, this is the number one podcast in support of door knocking. It is Serious Danger, a podcast about green politics in Australia, produced by Michael the Griff Griffin. I'm Emerald Moon, and that is Tom Ballard. How are you going, Tom? Uh, je m'appelle Tom. Uh, je t'aime. Ooh. Bonsoir. Uh, Paris. <laughs> Je I'm in Paris. <laughs> He's in Paris. That's really nice. Yeah. Well, I am a yoga and tourable country. I'm in Mianjin. I am, uh, well, am I excited? Look, I am looking forward to our discussion this week about the Greens being blockers and wreckers in Parliament on housing and also environmental reforms and just how mad it's making Albanese and the Labor government. She, she, she. Tee hee. Thanks to our patrons who support the show. We love you. SeriousDangerPod.com is our website, but go to patreon.com forward slash SeriousDangerAU. <laughs> if you just chip in three bucks a month, you get bonus content. Thank you to our new patrons. Check this out, Emerald. We've got Nay, Gino, Tom, 12Cast4, <laughs> Pedro, and Vanessa Amorossi herself. Wow. Vanessa Amorossi. So she was listening after all. Incredible. Maybe that's Rebecca Maserati. Having you at a fun or someone else, I don't know. I don't care, but um, we love it, Vanessa. We love your music. We we'll love your support of the show. Us. Yeah, we do. Vanessa and Rossi will be enjoying our latest Patreon episode, which came out this past week. Our latest instalment of Patty Manning's book, Inside the Greens. We read part of, oh no, we read chapter six, picking fights on the first term of the Howard government, and a little bit about the fight against the Japaluka uranium mine, and of course. Scott Ludlam's featuring in that, a very young Scott Ludlam, and how he really needed his mummy. No. <laughs> For people who listen, we talked about this play that uh, Scott Ludlam apparently wrote called Atomic Oz. Um, it was an anti nuclear play starring uh, Joe Valentine as playing Mrs. Mop. Michael the Griff Griffin managed to track down the original script and some photos of people performing the play Atomic Oz. It's on the <laughs> Patreon page. We maybe we'll do a reading for the play mm-hmm. further down the uh, track yeah. for patron listeners. That's an exclusive uh, content thing, but incredible work from the Griffs there. Absolutely incredible work. Speaking of incredible work, please provide update on the New South Wales election results. It happened. Yes, yeah, happened Saturday last week. Um, obviously, the results happened after we recorded last week's episode. Um, local council elections across the state of New South Wales. Were you following these much? Your family lives in New South Wales. Were they reporting back on all the highs and lows and exciting local council. I, to be honest, was not following these too much. I think I'm a little bit caught up in my own election. Um, but I heard I heard good things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty good news for us. Uh, the votes are still being counted. I think that the official final results aren't sort of announced until October, so there's a lot of counting still to go on. But some big picture takeaways, as you probably know, the Liberals fully fucked it. There was this big story about the mm-hmm. New South Wales Liberals failing to register uh, <laughs> candidates in time. Uh, it affected more than 50 winnable seats for the party. 41 seats that they won in 2021 went to other parties because of this big mistake. Sucked in. Mm. Unfortunately, this benefited the Libertarian Party, uh, formerly known as the Liberal Democrats, oh. a.k.a. a bunch <laughs> of fucking crazies. They ran more candidates than any party outside of the majors and the Greens and picked up a lot of the Liberals' votes. They could have won mm. up to 15 votes across the state and could have won a majority on the Mid Coast Council. We get to see. What a majority libertarian local council government looks like, Emerald. Wow. Okay. Uh, Can they, like, yeah, get some sort of carve out? I mean, what when I think of them, I just think of like gun laws, but I also think of like cannabis. They're a weird one, the libertarians, because you know, obviously, they support some of the things that we do, but they're also they certainly do not support (laughs) some things that we um, would support, or the other way around. 
I assume you just won't need to wear a seatbelt anywhere on the in the mid coast for the next uh, four years. No seatbelts. Pretty good. Lower age yeah. of consent. Um, who knows? <laughs> Uh, Labor had pretty generally mixed results, um, probably losing the mayoralty and uh, the majority on council in Newcastle, but winning in uh, Wollongong. Um, they took a few hits in Western Sydney. Clover Moore was returned as the mayor of the city of Sydney. This is her sixth term wow. after almost 20 years in power. Wild. But she did have a reduced vote, pretty substantially actually, and looks like her team is going to lose their majority on the city of Sydney council. So that's kind of interesting. I think she said this is going to be our last mm. term. But uh, yes, a, a force of nature in New South Wales local politics, Clovermore gets another term. Yeah. And what about us, the New South Wales Greens? We did really pretty bloody well. In 2021, uh, New South Wales Greens won 65 council seats. 2024 was the biggest ever campaign for local councils. 306, 376 candidates in 61 contests. Wow. We are on track to increase the number of councillors across the state, which I assume would be a record, the most councillors ever. Mm. We won additional seats in Newcastle and Wollongong. We are on track to win the mayoralty in Byron Bay, it seems, which would be pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. In the inner west, Didn't the Greens we already had- have that? I know I should know this, but I thought we already- Oh, well, I think the guy, the previous mayor was a member of the Greens and then was caught up in some dodgy scandals and right. stuff. And so okay. we don't want to claim that one, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Gotcha. He, he did bad stuff, but- Anyway, and I don't know much about the history there, but we know that the that, that particular Shire Council is very progressive, but very looks great. like the Greens can be doing well then. Um, in the inner west of Sydney, the Greens had four of its five councils retiring in this election, and we held on to all those seats. All of those were returned mm. to Greens members, which is pretty good, but Labor has maintained its majority on the council there, which mm. I think there was some talk that maybe the Greens were hoping to grow the vote there. That is, of course, uh, Greens Heartland, but it didn't happen. The brilliant mm -hmm. Sylvie Ellsmore has been returned to the City of Sydney, which is great. There is a chance we might get another green seat on City of Sydney, which would be cool. Okay. And quite a lovely surprise, we won our first ever seats in Western Sydney, including Bankstown, Cumberland and Ryde. This is the first time we've ever mm -hmm. had Greens councils in Western Sydney, traditionally Labour heartland, very diverse communities. Um, pretty exciting stuff that, yes, the Greens are doing the work and reaping results from that. So... Congratulations to all the New South Wales uh, Greens comrades. Good stuff. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it makes me think about, I, I guess, Western Sydney. I don't know all that much about, you know, geopolitics of, of Sydney and New South Wales. Um, but as I understand it, it's a similar push that we're like, if we can break through in Western Sydney, it's similar to like moving further south or breaking into the suburbs around Brisbane. Um, so there's a little bit of hope there. That's exciting. Mm. And look, I don't know. Enough about this too, Wayne, but a lot of the chat around it was, is Labor on the nose in these suburbs because of its position on Gaza? Mm. Uh, the Greens have been speaking out on Gaza. Obviously, the ability of local councils to have a massive effect on such a foreign policy issue is one thing, but rather just, and we're also seeing people from the Muslim vote campaign also starting to campaign and organize around these seats as well. So some are saying it could suggest mm. an early indication that people are saying Labor being sort of half us on genocide is bad, actually, and maybe they don't believe in the things mm. they say. That Yes. Well, speaking of New South Wales, we are going there in November. Um, we've mentioned this on a couple of previous shows, but if you haven't got tickets yet, they are selling for our live shows in November the 23rd and the 24th in Newcastle and Sydney, respectively. We're going to be in Newcastle on the Saturday the 23rd when the People's Blockade is happening, blockade of the world's largest coal port. Um, so we'll be at the Newcastle Comedy Club at 2 p.m. And then the following day, the Sunday, the 24th, we're going to be in Newtown in Sydney at the Vanguard at, from 1.30 p.m. Tickets are on sale. They're roughly $25, $27 plus booking fees. Um, the links are in the show notes or seriousdangerpod.com. They're linked there as well. We would really love to see you there. The live shows are always a lot of fun. We'll have some fantastic guests and, um, I don't know, just good vibes. Good vibes. Good vibes. But I'll tell you what I think, just to be safe, I'll do the reading and planning, and you do the building. How did I know you'd try to weasel out of doing any work? Oh, now, that is plain unfair. It, it's inaccurate and not what's going to happen. All right, well, 
we're back on the housing wars. The housing wars, they never end. Um, <laughs> the government tried and failed this week to push its help to buy bill through the Senate uh, and it kind of ramped up its rhetoric around the Greens being blockers both on the housing bills and the environmental reforms that are um, they're trying, trying to get through Parliament at the moment. So we'll talk about the housing bills first and then we can chat about the environmental reforms. Quick refresher. So the Health to Buy bill was the one that they tried to push through this week. There's more if folks are interested and want to go back for a deep dive on this, but we spoke about this in a fair bit of depth with Adam Bant actually on the podcast in episode 113 for those who are interested. But the bare bones of this scheme, it's a scheme where the government can take on 30% or 40% of your mortgage for existing or new homes. Um, respectively. 10,000 households a year would get access to this special loan. The LNP are opposed to the scheme, which means the Greens hold the balance of power in the Senate. What's your... uh, One thing I was interested in is like, do you think that the Greens position is being fairly represented on this now? Is it... Like I saw a few pieces of media that are like, oh, the Greens position is they think that it's not good enough, doesn't address the scale of the housing crisis. Or are they representing that the Greens have raised genuine concerns about how this could make the housing crisis worse. Mm, Interesting. Well, I mean, yes, depending where you're getting your media sources, you could get the impression Mm. that we just hate housing, actually. We just want to actually blow blow (laughs) it up. yeah. (laughs) And we love homelessness and we want to increase it. I mean, I don't know if you saw or if you're talking about it in that Patrick Gorman piece from WA that wrote this unhinged piece that was just questions like, why do the Greens hate housing? Like that that was the extent Mm. of the analysis. That's the level that the right. Labor Party at least is engaging with the Greens technique uh, critiques rather of this legislation. But generally, okay. I would say when Max goes on the project, you know, he does get the chance to be like, you know, we think to this this out. legislation is bad. Here's the things we want to negotiate on, and in there, you're getting things like <clears throat> negative gearing, tax concessions, and mm-hmm. um, a rent freeze. I'd say there's there's still sort of kicking through. I think maybe the media gets bored about having talking about those policies again because they feel like we've done all this, mm. but um, the yeah. Greens still believe in it and we're still talking about it. Yeah. Uh, sorry if it's boring, but people are homeless. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry. Um, so <laughs> there are problems with this bill. This is the thing. It's not like we're saying, oh, it, it, it's not like uh, you are committing $2 billion for housing and we want you to commit $5 billion because more people uh. need homes. The problem isn't just that the eligibility is so narrow because I mean, that's one of the issues. Like it's um, there are about 5 million households, adult renter households that would technically be eligible to access this scheme, but only about 0.2% would get access because it's it's capped at 10,000. So there is that, that it's like, look, this is way too small to make the kind of difference that we need. But the problem is even if you broadened it so that more people could access it, the nature of the scheme means that it's likely to be inflationary. It's likely to actually drive up house prices because it is a purely demand side solution and it doesn't increase supply in any way or reform any of those like the, the systemic issues that are driving house prices up. So right. there's that side of it. The other issue is the <laughs> what it would mean for people who can even get access to the scheme, like how difficult it is to access it. And then the mismatch between these really low really low income caps for eligibility, low caps on property prices for eligibility, and that contrasted with extremely high median dwelling prices, obviously. So the property price caps are set between, like, for example, in in Queensland at $700,000, New South Wales $950,000. You can't access the scheme for a a house or a property that costs more than that. Those are all well below median dwelling values, obviously, like New South Wales Median dwelling value is $1.18 million. Queensland is $875,000 as opposed to the 700000 cap. So there's already problems problem no, sorry, there because these, you're going to struggle. Yeah. Are these dwellings or just houses or like houses and apartments? I mean, I mean, yeah, if that's your cap dwellings. and it's like you have no choice but to buy an apartment really if you're living anywhere near, anywhere vaguely near the city, right? It, it would have to be an apartment. Yeah. I'm not saying that buying an apartment is bad, but I'm just saying like that's that's like, that just rules out any house within <laughs> within Kui of yeah. of major city yeah. centres, right? And those caps, those price caps are for the capital cities and regional centres. Like the caps are actually lower for outside of the state. Like if you go okay. outside the capital cities and regional centres and want to access one of these, access the scheme in New South yeah. Wales, then you have to get a dwelling that's under seven hundred fifty thousand dollars or under. Okay. 
550,000 in Queensland. So it's really getting like that is difficult to find a home, right? Um, And then you have to fall under the income limit. So $90,000 per annum for individuals or $120,000 for couples. I didn't also realize until this week that you also have to remain there at that income level indefinitely. If you are earning more than that for two consecutive years, you have to repay the government like you're out of of the scheme. And the problem is that, yeah, like there's this analysis that was done by the Australian, I think Max Chandler May that was talking about this this week as well, that so even if you get the government to take on 30 to 40% of the home, you get a reduced deposit, it's near impossible if you have that income to secure a mortgage because obviously it's going to uh, like it's going to be difficult to show that you can service a mortgage for the balance because you have such a low income. Um, and then if you do manage to get a mortgage, you're in a situation where you're probably really over leveraged and you're going to be in mortgage stress because you're paying between like half to more than 100% of your income based on median incomes and the kind of prices prop, uh, like the kind of mortgages that you'd be taking on in order right. to service it. And all of this is why the Greens have pointed out, well, there was a very similar scheme actually with the the same income and home price limits in New South Wales that has already failed. There are that there've only been 503 places used out of 600 in the first 2 years. We know that this like does not work because it's so flawed. Uh-huh. But the government is like, no, we want to fucking pass it, and so we are going to pass it, whether you like it or not, because that's how democracy works, right? <laughs> well, well, you're not going to pass it if you don't have our support, whether you like it or not. You're going to try, and then presumably, and we'll get to this, but turn it into a political attack if the Greens eventually decide to vote it down. But I mean, yeah, you have you need the Greens' support in order to pass it because the coalition's not going to do it, mate. Well, that's I don't like it when you tell me that because I'm the Prime Minister of Australia <laughs> and I want to pass what I want to pass. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's right. So the, the the start of this week, we had heard that the government was like looking to probably bring on the help to buy bill, um, trying to push it through the Senate and effectively trying to increase the pressure on the Greens to just get on board and and pass it. Um, To the extent that Albanese is responding to media queries about whether he would, like, call an early election or whether this would be a double dissolution trigger, and he said, quote, well, we'll wait and see. (laughs) We've obviously, like, we've spoken before about double dissolution and what it is. Can you give us a quick refresher on what this what this means? What he's actually saying when he's like, "Yeah, we might, we might do this." That would be terrible for us. Who knows? Yeah. We're crazy. Yeah, we're fucking crazy. I've got a gun against my head. I'll pull it. I don't give a <laughs> yeah, shit. I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> a double dissolution election is an election in which um, the the full Senate is up for election. Okay, so normally only half the Senate is up for election every three years, as senators have six year mm-hmm. terms. A double dissolution election says. They're all, fuck all these unrepresentative swill. Everybody's going to the polls. Mm. Yep. And it can only be triggered if a bill is rejected by the Senate twice constitutionally. With three Have months I got that in correct? between, right? With three months yeah. in between, yes. So you said yeah. the same bill, uh, well, more or less the same bill through the Senate. If the Senate rejects it twice, then the government can say, the system ain't working. Let's purge the whole mm. thing. Everyone goes to the polls. Yeah. And we'll get a new Senate with definitely a Labor majority. <laughs> Everyone really Labor likes the majority. Labor Party right now. We mm, haven't had a Labour yeah, set of majority well like for ages, but this is going to be just go yeah. really, really well. Yeah. So yeah. let's do it. Yeah. I think it's like there's the argument that obviously this would be an incredibly stupid thing for Albanese to do, for the Labour Party to do. There's also the questions about whether it is legally, constitutionally possible. Um, there's questions about whether what, like whether this constitutes a trigger. So the... So, okay, last year, the last time this was coming up was again in the housing debate when the government was saying, oh, we've got legal advice that even though the Senate hasn't rejected the Housing Australia Future Fund bill, the half that the Greens were in the balance of power on, because they've delayed it, that constitutes a potential double dissolution trigger and we might go to a double dissolution. The Greens disagree. Not everyone is on board with that. Um, But it's been pointed out that maybe they're also relying on that similar, like that same advice to apply to the bill to rent bill, which is their other housing bill they've got before the Senate at the moment, where the Greens are again in the balance of power. Um, And they're saying that they might be relying on that decision 
by the Senate to send that bill to an inquiry in, I think, June. Yes, June, rather than passing it. So that would mean that they then got three months since then if they brought that back on, like if they if they brought that back to the Senate and, and the Senate fails to pass it again, that that could potentially be a trigger because the other problem is, it's getting a little bit technical, but like the other problem is that as Anthony Green pointed out, for there to be a double dissolution election, it would have to take place by 25 January because it needs to happen six months before the House of Representatives expires. So oh God. this would need there would need to be a trigger that happens before then, and then the election would be in March. And so he's like, well, how do you meet the three months delay requirement? Um, but Paul Carp was like, well, they would rely on build to rent bill. Right. And then yeah. is it also not complicated by the fact that you know, this week Labor was tweeting the Greens just voted and the coalition just mm. voted up to block housing. They hate housing. We hate housing. The Greens are the worst in political party. They're uh, Satan incarnate and they have just voted to block housing. Yeah. And they were greeted on Twitter at least with a whole <laughs> bunch of community notes saying, yeah. what the fuck are you no, talking about? The Greens did not vote to do that. They, they voted not to suspend standing orders, which effectively yeah, delays classic. the passage of the bill, right? That's like yeah. right? which is funny because I mean th- this is one of those things that obviously in the past the Greens would use a similar vote to say oh the Greens uh, or you know the government voted down I think maybe it was the Palestine like a motion to recognize Palestine or right. something like that that we would move to suspend standing orders in order to move that the government votes not to um, suspend standing orders and then we would say well they have clearly they're voting against the, the motion, but it's like, well, no, technically they vote against that. What the government did, this was on Tuesday afternoon, um, Labor moves in the Senate to bring the help to buy bill to a vote and the coalition, the Greens, One Nation and Independence blocked that attempt. They say, no, nope, we're going to delay the vote until the 26th of, of November. But, yes, Albanese was posting that, you know, the coalition and, and the Greens had blocked the bill, had voted down the bill and got um, community noted. <laughs> Brutal. All right, yes. so just quickly, what's the bill to rent scheme? Mm. Let's go through that. Yeah, the bill to rent scheme, okay, because I was like, I honestly kind of forgot about this because it, it's just like the forgotten, I don't know, little, little brother of the help to buy bill. But this is one of those ones, a few state governments I think have been doing this too, where they are proposing a scheme to offer tax concessions to private developers who agree to set aside some of their homes in a new development, some of the the units um, as quote unquote affordable housing. In this instance, a minimum of 10%, um, but affordable housing is defined in relation to the median rent for the other dwellings in that development and just has to be 75% of that market rent for the other dwellings. So you can literally just build like a very expensive, very fancy new apartment block, for example, um, quote unquote luxury apartments, set the rents really high and then say, oh, well, these ones, these 10% are slightly lower than that, but they would still be much higher than, you know, an ordinary person could afford, certainly than anyone on low income could afford. And this is like multiple experts have attested to this. It came up in the Senate inquiry it has been shown to happen before. It's We've seen how when there are similar like build to rent schemes in place or the way the build to rent works, property developers literally openly say, oh, we make a massive premium on these by building these high-end projects and also reaping the benefits of government schemes that act as though we're building affordable housing when really we are building incredibly unaffordable housing because we wouldn't build it unless we could make a fucking profit because this is a scheme that once again relies on for-profit private property developers to deliver housing when their primary motive is always going to be profit. So that's the build to rent stuff. <laughs> Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. it makes sense the way you've explained it, but it doesn't make sense, you know, universally as a the, politically as a <laughs> yeah. concept philosophically as a no, solution yeah. to the housing crisis yeah no it does not it does not that's exactly right um so no there are these two bills that labor obviously is like we're going to solve the housing crisis the greens don't want to they hate housing they're blockers <laughs> they block we build blah 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 they uh, whereas the greens are saying well we have offered to negotiate time and time again we've got as you mentioned like the position of the greens is we're willing to come to the table and even though we think your bill is kind of shit, look, if you are 
willing to put in place measures that will address some of the issues that your um, help to buy scheme doesn't address and could potentially exacerbate, then we will consider supporting your bill. So freezing and capping rent increases is one of them. Tax reform is the other one. So negative gearing and capital gains discounts or direct investment in building more public housing like by creating a publicly owned property developer, for example. Um, Greens housing spokesperson, Max Jane LaMaitha, has accused the government of self-sabotage, saying it's no longer genuinely negotiating. He says, quote, it would be a great tragedy if the Prime Minister's personal dislike of the Greens saw him reject <laughs> good ideas. <laughs> Touche. Um, shady bitch, shady bitch. <laughs> but he's right. That would be a shame. A, a it tragedy. would be a shame. It would be a shame. I think, yeah, and, I, and I'm curious to like to, comparing this to the way that the debate on the half bill played out last year, I think that the intensity of the debate and like the heat on the Greens, I guess, I think it's less than it was last year. And I think that it's much harder for Labor to take the approach that they're taking. I think they're in a much weaker position because the Greens were ultimately able to secure $3 billion in additional funding for social and affordable housing by right. holding out on their position on the half. And so for the government to just be like, see, no, the Greens don't deliver, they just block, I think it doesn't quite ring as true. And I think obviously we still face a very hostile media landscape and there still are hit pieces running on the Greens and not necessarily super fair coverage. But even like I, I think the media are a little bit more I guess, open to covering the reality of this, which is that the Greens are trying to negotiate and Labor is refusing to. Yeah, I just think this the bitching and moaning from Labor, just you just can't do that every time, right? People saying, okay, we've been here before. Okay, even if you agree, like, oh, I think the Greens are being unreasonable. You're the government. You've got this legislation. You want to get it passed. You will have to do something to mm. get your agenda through. You will have to- yeah. In some way, change, meet them halfway, engage in negotiations in order to bring the Greens on board. You can't just bitch and moan constantly and expect yeah. them to do anything and expect people to believe that the Greens are rubbing their hands together saying, ha, 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 yes, we've delayed mm, more housing. housing. This is why yeah, we got yeah. into politics is to make people's <laughs> yeah. lives worse. And we hate it. We hate people having houses. We love the rental crisis. No, I think by now, at least, a, a significant mm. proportion of the electorate know that the Greens are fighting very, very hard to get their agenda through. They have they have reasons for why they're playing these political games and and um, and and engaging these negotiations and holding fast to their political strategy because they want to extract concessions because they know that the government isn't doing enough. And I think the general mood in the country is that people think, yeah, this Labor government is not doing very much at all and doesn't seem to be prepared to stick to their guns or make serious reforms at all. So the Greens' well, message is they're probably pretty receptive to the Greens' message. Or to even engage with the policy solutions that are being offered. Like this exchange right. between Albanese and Patricia Carvelis at, at the ABC is so telling where so he, he accuses her of asking, quote, not terribly clever questions. She's asking him about whether they would consider negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions, which is something that many people, not just the Greens, are calling for. And he says... Well, Patricia, I don't answer the sort of... Uh uh, those sort of questions in the way that you mean good ones. Yeah, ref, 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 well, that's a good question. Good. Are, not, you, are you are you going to say no to those they're or not, not? Clever, they're things that journalists. The next question is, when will the election be? And it's like he just <laughs> won't even like. It's like we're talking about a policy debate on housing. So yes. what's your position? But he thinks he seems to genuinely think it's unreasonable to ask him to like take a position on that. Well, of course, yes. their position is we tried that in 2019 and we lost, which again is an argument that is. Surely yeah. failing. The housing crisis has gotten worse. You've won government. Yeah. Everyone knows yeah. these concessions suck and they're unfair. It's politically popular to reform them. Yes. You might just need to have another crack at the political political fight that you lost once. Come on, mate. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I think it's true that, yes, obviously Albanese's personal dislike of the Greens, I think, is Absolutely. getting in the way here. Um, and they're so tied up in like how to lose, how to avoid losing more political skin on this, that they're tying themselves in knots and like not approaching it logically in a way. Yeah. I mean, you can see even like it's just so transparent what they're trying to do on this. Before all of this started playing out this week, on Monday they dropped this story to the media about the first homes that had been supported by the half. And the angle was, you know, a lot of these projects wouldn't necessarily receive 
uh, funding for some time or they wouldn't be completed for some time. And the angle is, well, if the Greens had got out of the way the first time, we would have been able to support these homes through the fund sooner. And so they should take yeah. a lesson from this when we bring our bills back to, to the Senate this week. Um, but they announce, so Housing Minister Claire O'Neill announces these 185 housing projects with 13,700 homes that had been approved for the first round of grants under the HAF. That includes 4,200 social homes built by nonprofits and 10,000 affordable homes the, for middle and lower income people and 1,267 are crisis housing. Most of them are apartments, about five in six of the projects, and most are one to two bedroom, which explains why it's like only 185 projects, but like 13,700 homes. Right. But I feel like it was a very, it, it was a bit of a transparent, quick, let's get these numbers out here because this is the theme of the week and this is what we're going to be doing this, this week. Because then the ABC reported the next day that, quote, the federal government does not know how much it is spending on the thousands of social and affordable homes greenlit by its housing agency, with most funding likely to be years away. A oh. Monday announcement that new homes would be supported through the government's fund was made before grants were finalised and, in some cases, before successful applicants were told. Mm. <laughs> um, okay. Which I, and I'm not really sure. Like, I don't know, I think, to be fair, Maybe some of that is normal process for, you know, that announcement of the total number to be given to media before it's like fully finalized. I, I don't want to fall into if this is just, you know, ABC journalists trying to be like, aha, aren't we good calling you out? Um, I think it's it's fair that you can't build homes overnight. Like they've got the estimated start and end dates and they're saying, oh, well, a lot of these won't be completed for another two years. And it's like, well, yes, like it does. It takes time to build a home. But yeah. I think what it, it does do is expose like the problems with the scheme, which is why the Greens were not supportive of it or like wanted something better in the first place, because it's all about these like complex grants arrangements to subsidize uh, you know, third parties building social and, and quote unquote affordable homes, not even public housing. Like you look at that breakdown, there's no public housing. As far as I can see, no mention of government owned projects. It's all these like nonprofits. And the fact that out of 13, like the 10,000 of them roughly are just quote unquote affordable. So not tied to income concerning. Wow. Right. Um, but again, like the way that they work, the reason that the money won't be distributed from the fund for some time or that they don't necessarily know how much it'll cost is because they're these availability grants. Uh, do you know, did you know that this is how the half works? Like I was a little bit, I guess I wasn't quite, a, quite across how it actually worked, that it's not about providing funding for it to be built. It's about once it's built, then they provide these grants for them to keep offering it as social or affordable housing, basically. Oh, okay. No, I didn't know that at yeah. all. Yeah. So basically the half can offer zero interest loans and long-term quote-unquote availability grants. Those are paid annually to housing providers once the projects are complete for up to 25 years. Um, so this is how they said they're like in unlocking supply. They're ensuring feasibility so that you can say to these third-party providers, well, if you build, you will know that you will have somewhat guaranteed like income or revenue coming back in from the government but it means that, yeah, the, the fund can make this $500 million available every year, but it's up to them how and when they spend it. So that may not even, that doesn't necessarily show that the fund is making money, has that money, that that money is going out the door in any way yet. Like it's just saying, oh, there are these projects going on that we would like to support through the fund. So, And then add to this the story we had a couple of weeks ago about how the half is spending, what, $30 million on consulting fees or something like that or some, oh, I didn't some even crazy see that crazy amounts of that. money about like the amount of yes consultation stuff that's, that's going on cool. the <laughs> albanese's half has paid 24 million dollars to consultants and six million dollars in executive salaries last year despite not yet completing a single house and i guess the afr is reporting the story about the 1300 homes as you know just 700 homes are going to be built from the half this year which i guess is based on those mm. estimates but again your point saying it does take time but yeah those are not great numbers 700 homes mm. in one year $30 million to the suits. Mm. 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 And again, still not the government being in the business of directly building housing, which they should be, and they could be if they had something like a publicly owned property developer. Maybe we'll get one. Maybe they'll come to the table. We shall fucking see. 
EPA, the referee in the game of life, fighting for the earth. EPA, the lawyer whose client is the public and the people to remind us what our health is worth. Okay, so similar story with the old the old environment. The other thing that apparently <laughs> the Greens hate, I guess, because yes, they're not doing everything famously. <laughs> that the Labour Party wants. <laughs> uh, so we have the, the fight in Parliament this week about the government's proposed environmental reforms. Very quick recap. In 2022, Labor ran on its big Nature to Positive plan, introducing sweeping reforms of Australia's nature and environmental laws overhauling habitat and species protection laws, specifically the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Protection Act, and establishing an Australian Environmental Protection Agency, an EPA, a kind of environmental watchdog. Last mm-hmm. month, Labor said, okay, that's a big agenda. We're going to split it up into separate <laughs> packages and we're going to leave the big ambitious stuff uh, for a later date, which is kind of like How hmm, unusual maybe running out of time to, to do that. But Yeah, later date, okay. I thought we were having an election soon because the Greens are blocking everything, but okay. <laughs> yes, maybe not. Industry and the BCA were very big fans of the idea of the Labor splitting up their uh, their environmental mm. policy, we please to know, so that's, that's always oh, a good, that's a good sign. sign. Yeah, good sign. Now, two weeks ago, we talked about this. We talked about the fact that Labor was considering making the EPA more business friendly and watering it down in order to win coalition support. The new version would mean the EPA wouldn't be able to stop or block climate projects. It would be a compliance only body that would oversee existing environmental laws and it would according to the abc we mentioned this line last time mirror the morrison government's approach to nature conservation which is a a chilling that's sentence that's how you know it's good <laughs> <laughs> so why don't the greens like it What's yeah it's problem? weird it's weird we went on board we thought that was really bad and we said hey how about you consider ending um native forest logging as part of your environmental reforms and inserting a climate trigger into our environment laws so that we can say, well, no, this project is going to cool the planet. Let's uh, nix it. Mm-hmm. Now, when we talked about it two weeks ago, the general impression I got was like, yeah, Labor was saying, fuck the Greens, we're going to water this down and talk to the coalition in order to get these laws passed. Is that mm. kind of what you thought was happening as well? I think That maybe was it. the vibe I thought, but that right. seems to have maybe shifted. Well, yes, it seems that during the whole time, Plibersek has still been negotiating, still desperately trying to get support. Um, of course, she said that if we don't vote, vote for it, it would be, the Greens CPRS Mark II, um, <laughs> but of course they're also talking tough. And again, we find Labor in this position in which they have to constantly shit on the Greens to talk about how stupid and bad we are while behind the <laughs> scenes having to have, have an adult negotiation with us because yeah. what do you know, we have the balance of power in the Senate. So. Yes, yeah. So looks like things might be moving. Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek is negotiating to convince the Greens to vote for a paired back Environmental Protection Agency and EPA with the impasse likely to delay the nature law reform until October at the earliest. And this is terrible because Plibersec is hosting, I forget what it's called now, some big environmental um, conference in October and these laws won't be sorted out by then with this delay. Oh, yeah, I did see this, yeah. Anthony Albanese emphatically ruled out the Greens' calls for a reformed environmental laws to include a climate trigger that would see proposed resources projects barred if they admitted too much atmospheric pollution. He sort of said against he's against it. We're ruling it out. There's no way we're doing it. Why is he against the trigger? Well, Albanese told reporters in Canberra that the Greens political party have never seen any piece of legislation they're not confused by. Any piece of legislation they don't bring up things as a distraction in order to justify voting against it. They should vote for the nature what? positive legislation as it stands. Did what that you, sentence make sense? This? Or am I <laughs> It's, maybe, it's a bad sentence. Hey, maybe it's just my fault as a green being confused <laughs> by Albanese's incredible rhetoric. I don't know. That sentence definitely meant something. Confused by? We just don't get it. Our greens brains mm, can't understand. Just don't understand. Then listen to this. This was, I could not believe it. I had to read this twice. I don't support adding a trigger to that legislation, Mr. Albanese said on Monday. Climate issues, he said were best dealt with through the government's safeguard mechanism, which began this year and forces big resources, industrial and manufacturing emitters, to slash climate warning emissions. We've dealt with that, he said. We have a target of 43% and we have a vehicle for emissions of large emitters as well as part of that program. Dealt with. All done. That's so good. So good. (laughs) Just a reminder, the targets that you had were completely out of line with the science. Yeah. Secondly, it looks like we're not even going to reach those targets of 43% reduction yeah, by 2030. Yeah, going up. 
Mm-hmm. It, 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 thirdly, yes, emissions are actually arising and have been going up <laughs> at a higher than they were in the last election. But apart from that, we've mm-hmm. totally dealt with that. And so there's no reason to possibly. Mm. Apart from the fact that the safeguard mechanism is about domestic emissions, and this was always the entire point, is that we need a trigger to consider the climate impacts of coal and gas projects that are approved in Australia, where the resources are then extracted to be shipped overseas, to be burnt, which warms the climate in which we all live, including Australia. But right. Maybe, maybe Albanese doesn't understand that, doesn't <laughs> understand how emissions work. He's so confused. Hey, here's a fun fact for you, Emerald. In 2005, Anthony Albanese introduced a bill calling for a climate trigger in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, accusing the Howard government of procrastinating on a climate change trigger since 1999. Oh, wow. Green Senator Sir Anson Young described a climate trigger as Albanese's own policy. Check that the fucking goal on that that. shit. 2005, the, the climate crisis has only gotten worse and more apparent now. You're, now you're the fucking prime minister and you are still yeah. serving up this bullshit and rejecting us, the people who actually care about the climate, to fight for the thing that you wanted to do 20 years ago, you fucking weirdo. Yeah. Wow. I mean, so one thing I'm curious about, and I think maybe you're about to get to this, but my understanding is this week we learned there was a potential compromise where they would – agree to not necessarily a climate trigger that means projects are rejected if they have this they they have unacceptable climate impacts but a trigger to have them have the climate impacts considered as criteria when projects are, are um considered under the EPBC the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act I have to admit I thought a climate trigger just meant that that was a trigger for consideration under that act, not that it would mean those projects are all refused. So I actually thought this was what we wanted. I think this would be not a terrible compromise. Am I wrong? Okay, right. Well, I mean, I guess the the wording that I've got here is, or the impression rather that I've got, is that um, the trigger is clearly something else. It has more power to, in order to, the actual mm. power to actually stop projects like on a climate right. basis. And the very strong resistance I, we're getting from the Labor government is that no, that that power should not be inserted in this legislation because they know that would result in the stopping of fossil fuel projects, which they do not want to do because they get like donations to the fossil fuel yeah. industry. Yes. And particularly, it seems the commentary is saying that Albanese is scared about losing those seats they won in WA. And that's the state mm. where you know this kind of stuff is really coming home. That's the impression mm. I've got. Well, you know, when they try to reduce WA's GATS and services tax, what do they think is going to happen? <laughs> I mean, look, if that's true, if that is true, then that's good, I suppose. The consideration thing is like, okay, but it's very easy to imagine a scenario in which they said, oh, we considered it. Don't you worry about that. Well, we also considered the fact that this would make lots of money yeah. for people who yes, don't have to political suppose- party. And maybe this is my lack of understanding about how EPBC approvals work. Um, perhaps there is a difference between the criteria that you consider when you're looking at whether to approve something and the list of reasons on, like, based on which you can reject a proposal, perhaps. Yeah. And this is the difference between, yeah, that consideration and and a rejection trigger. So, I mean, if if the system were going to work effectively, then if you considered the climate impacts of these projects then they would all be refused because the evidence is manifestly, like abundantly clear that we can't afford um, to approve any new coal or gas in order to protect us from the absolute worst of, of climate change. Um, but given the way that the EPBC works and that you know, environmental approvals work in general in government, I suppose it's fair to expect that, yes, consideration would not be enough. Because <laughs> we, we're fighting for something different than what we have now, right? And what mm. we have now is my, the environmental uh, minister has no obligation or no legal requirement. Oh. Do I have to put pants on for this? I'm sorry, that's probably someone getting annoyed at the, at the noise. I could think I was near. Oh, because it's late. It was late. Yeah, it's 1.30. Mm. Should we do a quick quick wrap-up? Yuck. Sorry. You just want to be quiet. Tom has to speak quietly now because it is 1.30 a.m. in Paris and the French are mad at him for, for yelling into his microphone. <laughs> so. So what's going to happen with this bill, Tom? <laughs> well, I guess we're just going to wait and see. And I suppose <laughs> the question is, 
Should the Greens vote this legislation down if Labor doesn't play ball? That's the open question, of course. The Labor wants to position it saying that, of course, the Greens would sell environment down the, um, down the river, so to speak. Uh, but, of course, we're fighting for something else. Mm. The same question we have with the housing is like it's kind of a, you know, staring each other down kind of chicken who will bling first kind of vibe, I suppose. Well, but at least it seems as though we've got something on this. Like I think if we were able to change the, yeah, as you say, the status quo where climate impacts aren't considered at all as part of the EPPC process, that would be a positive step forward and something that we probably should then support. Perhaps if we can get maybe something on native forest logging as well, um, that would be enough for us to pass it. Uh, But it's certainly more than we're getting on the housing bills where they have not provided any counteroffer as far as as at the time of recording. I'm pretty sure that's what's been reported. They've literally given nothing. So that's a different situation, I think. Right. Yeah, for sure. Don't forget to say your prayers. No, mister. You best call me Tom. Good night, God bless. Good night, Mr. Tom. Good night, Tom. All right, well, Tom doesn't want any angry Parisians knocking on his door anymore at 1.30 a.m., so he's gone to bed. Our call to action this week before I leave you is get involved with an election near you. Um, There are a bunch across the country because – so there's the ACT election – uh, on the 19th of October and then there, I didn't realise, there's the Queensland election is on the 26th of October, which is also the date of the Victorian local elections. So a, a whole election fiesta. There's heaps of campaign launches and door knocking, obviously, to do. There's letterboxing, there's yard signs, there's um, volunteering on booths. Please, like, especially go door knocking but get involved with your local campaign. If you're not in the ACT or Queensland or Victoria maybe consider throwing some money their way or like sharing things on social media so that maybe your friends in those states will see it. Um, Just small little little bits of support uh, and getting ready to support the next campaigns that do happen in your area. We'll put the link in the show notes, but there's often stuff listed at greens.org.au forward slash events, but also ask your branch or message your local candidate or um, sign up at greens.org.au forward slash volunteer. Please also rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening now. Um, Please don't rate and review the podcast if you are the person that was staying in the room next to Tom in Paris. Um, We're really sorry for disturbing your sleep, talking about trying to save the world from climate crisis and the housing crisis. But anyway, um, you can also please support the show on Patreon, just three bucks a month. You get access to a bunch of bonus content and it helps pay our producer Mike and keep the show going. If you've got feedback or an idea for a Patreon episode or something for us to cover on the show, contact us um, by emailing hello at seriousdangerpod.com. And Please, if you haven't got a ticket yet for the New South Wales shows and you can come to Newcastle or Sydney on the 23rd or 24th of November, we'd really love to see you there. And our past, whatever, three or four live shows have all sold out. So genuinely, make sure you get a ticket before they sell out. Please don't be disappointed. The links are at seriousdangerpod.com and also in the show notes. We love you very much. See you next time. Serious Danger,